I'm going to be talking about the role that partnering plays in the success of smart cities. And I think here, being on the Microsoft booth, perhaps I'll be preaching to the converted. We're already here um, because of our partnerships that we formed in this space. And I'm going to start actually by talking about the experiences that we've seen and we can learn from, from the, the smart grid evolution that's taken place over the last two decades. The utilities around the world have tackled many of the same challenges technically that cities are facing now. How to integrate solutions together, how to connect um, devices and bring data back and manage. And so we should look at that to see where we can learn. I'll then think about how cities compare um, to utilities, uh, the, where they're similar and where they're different. And finally, I'll look at the enablers that cities do to help make sure that they foster these, uh, these partnerships. For those that don't know ITRON, we're a global technology provider that work with utilities and cities to help them connect, manage and control all the assets that they care about. In total, we connect over 200 million things around the world. That's everything from electricity, water, gas, renewables, uh, and city infrastructure. And we've achieved that by working with partners, by finding and nurturing partnerships with leading providers of all these different diverse use cases. So I wanted to start and run through the the story of what we observed in the smart grid evolution. So for many utilities, it started with this, with an electricity meter. They had a relatively simple business case in that they wanted to um, change the way that they, they metered their customers. They wanted to have to stop visiting customers' homes to get readings, and they wanted to roll out tariffs that changed in price during the day to reflect the varying price that they paid as a generator. So ITRON were lucky enough to be involved in some of the largest programs uh, around the US and internationally, and we were able to work with our customers to, to deploy millions of these meters. So what happened first? Well, the first thing that happened was that customers were very upset. Because cities had, uh, utilities had not really thought about the, what a meter would mean for their customers. Many of them never really considered their customers other than just a consumer, an invisible consumer at the end of the line. And so they rolled out new tariffs, but they gave no guidance to, to these homeowners. So there was no change in behavior, and therefore their bills went up. So actually many of the smart metering programs around the world started off and were typified by protests, people blocking people from installing meters on their homes, and major disruption to the programs, which was expensive for the utilities to, to manage. And utilities recognized quickly that they didn't know how to speak to consumers. They hadn't been used to consider behavior change and how to influence uh, these things. So they reached out to other providers that had experience in this and built standards to share the data from these meters with them so that they could build tools that would appeal and be effective in helping consumers. And they actually found that through this, their customer satisfaction went up because now they were giving value back to consumers in a program that originally was really more about optimizing their operating costs. And those same standards that shared the data from the smart meter to give the consumer information also enabled other applications to emerge, integration with home heating systems, air conditioning, and so on. And we started to see an ecosystem of vendors that grew up, many of them new startups, innovative companies that were taking this data and finding new ways to, to build value. And the, the utilities then also looked and said, well, how else can we use this infrastructure we've deployed, the communication networks we've deployed for the metering, the software platforms that we've deployed to help consumers, what else could they do? And they started to integrate their renewable programs, electric vehicle programs, and giving information back to consumers in, on other applications that they were deploying. Then they started to look at, well, how can this infrastructure help us 
get better visibility on what's happening across our distribution network. So again, they started to use these new net communication networks that were deployed for IoT applications to connect substation monitors, fault line detections, and they found that they could then more rapidly respond to issues and repair and restore uh, faults when they occurred. And this gave them an unprecedented view on what was happening across their network, uh, their power network they'd never had before. And they were able to then enable analytics. So they could take that power data and, for example, do load disaggregation. So they could identify which appliances are on in a home and potentially identify if someone's fridge is about to fail because the compressor cycle is, is changed from the norm. And all, all in all, what we found was that by fostering and enabling this ecosystem approach where they invited and helped other vendors come in to innovate on top of this core base element, the smart meter, they were able to significantly increase the value, significantly increase the innovation. And I think that's the lesson that we should carry over for smart cities. So, how do we think of utilities versus cities? Well, there are some big similarities. Both of them are generally massive. They'll often have the same complicated bureaucracy in how they, can, they procure and select technology. Um, and they also think of things in the long term. They're looking at assets over a 10, 15, 20 year period. However, there's some key differences as well. Utilities have the luxury of being able to plan structured evolution um, of their business. They can plan and schedule how they will change and grow and expand and optimize their costs. By contrast, cities are much more organic. They evolve, in, there's political pressures, um, and they evolve in response to the changing demands of their citizens. They also have to handle a much more complicated mixture of competing priorities. They have to think about energy consumption, but they also have to think about education, transport, waste, healthcare, and balance all these things in parallel while attracting uh, and growing their local economies. And so, for this reason, I think it's even more important and clearer that no one provider can solve all these problems for cities. And for that reason, collaboration is going to be even more important within the city market than it is uh, a has been for the utility market. And iTron's firm belief is that no one can do it alone and that the way to succeed in this space is for each company to recognize where it adds value and find and invest in ways that it can effectively work with other parties to get the value from them. Um, a good example is from the mobile industry where 20 years ago the market was dominated by providers that had great technology, that was loved by their customers, but they relied on um, in-house innovation. And that meant it was slow and incremental. And they've been completely overtaken by the providers that actively encourage and enable others to innovate on top of their platform. And this is how we all have the same phone in our pocket, but it does a hundred different things for each person based on their lifestyle, their priorities, um, and so on. And this is, we believe, what will, what will define success in the smart city, is having that flexibility that each city can tailor the solution to meet their specific needs in the specific order they want to do them um, with the specific partners that they've worked with. So iTron have worked with cities around the world um, to connect a whole range of different use cases. And one of the most consistent things we've learned is that every city we work with brings at least two new things that we've never done before. Two new partners, two new use cases, or does something completely, the same thing, completely differently to the last city we approached that problem with. And so the way that you can approach and tackle those problems is just as important as the shopping list of things that you have available today. To summarize the solution that we provide to our customers, there's three kind of core pillars one is that we help cities to enable connectivity for IoT assets. So that could be deploying new communication networks that are optimized for the IoT devices, but also blending those with the public networks that are available and the emerging technologies so we can have a common security and data management policy across those networks, allowing cities to then choose the right 
communication network for each application. We then have a device and data management platform that brings the data together from all these devices and sensors and controllers and allows the city to see what's happening right now in their city um, and to build layered intelligence by combining the data together. And then we have an ecosystem of integrated partners. Every customer brings new solutions and we are finding ways to make sure that after that, that same effort can then be brought to all of our existing customers. And when they bring new challenges, we have a way to then tackle those as well. Some of you may have seen the presentation from my colleague Carlos earlier that talked about the role street lighting is playing here. And we had seen 12 years ago when we started working with cities, it was clear that smart street lighting was going to play an important role in the evolution of smart cities because it was a very consistent business case that applied globally and the savings that were achievable were very powerful and important for cities to achieve. So we've invested specifically in the lighting area in building up the right partnerships technically um, and from a delivery perspective to, um, to make sure that we can, we can be competitive in that space. And cities are very often starting with street lighting and then moving on to tackle the other um, use cases that matter to them. And those cities are then now reaping the benefits of that, particularly recently with the rise in energy costs uh, that many cities are seeing. Those that have put in place the, a smart control system are able to rapidly respond and change their system, whether their priority is energy saving, operational saving, resilience, or customer satisfaction. These, these can all be uh, pointed to as benefits to the system. I mentioned the software platform earlier, which is the, the front end. This is the, 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 the application that our customers use to interact with these devices. And um, broadly, it enables them to bring together data from any device and visualize that in real time. They can customize it for their particular role within the city, and they can start to build intelligent uh, automation so that they can have events and, and actions triggered um, automatically. We've recently launched uh, our solution marketplace, and this is, a, this is a website that allows our customers to see all the use cases that have been deployed in other customers. We recognize that many of them will be doing new, new things, um, and iTron don't manufacture any of these devices. These are our partner products that, we've, that have met the needs of one customer, and we now want to present them to our global customer base so that they can evaluate if they will also meet their needs as well. And then we've, in 2018, iTron launched our developer program, which is a team who are entirely dedicated to helping technology partners integrate with our solution, whether that's a hardware integration, a software integration, an analytics integration. And this was an, inv uh, an investment by iTron, and we've seen huge rewards from that because we now are able to respond when a customer asks us to do something we've never done before, we can now move them through that process smoothly and quickly. So how can cities help promote and enable this? Well, standards is one part of the picture. Um, I, promoting and adopting standards is something that technology vendors do, but it's also actually important for cities to participate in this as well. There are still, um, there are standards, everything from hardware, physical interfaces, communication interfaces, and even the words we use to describe something. By standardizing these, we can make sure that we are um, talking about the same thing and we can learn and improve as, as things go on. And it's worth noting there is no silver bullet for standards. If we take just smart street lighting as an example, the end-to-end -end smart lighting solution, you could buy this 20 years ago but you had to buy everything from one vendor because it was it, it, there was no way of breaking up the solution and, and having interoperability between vendors. But we now have standards that sit at each level of this space and there's been significant work in each of these consortium to make sure it enables and fosters um, integration. Um, and for those interested in learning more, TALT is one of these standards which is a booth uh, further down the hall here. 
And cities also need to find ways to collaborate internally. I mentioned that the utility found, utilities were able to find that they could leverage the infrastructure they'd invested in for smart metering to then help them solve other problems. It's more complicated for cities as they have very often siloed structures and they don't communicate well with each other. So finding ways that they can share their problems, share their resources, build combined business cases is going to be important if you want to actually achieve that in the smart city space. An example of this is the Urban ICT Arena in Greater Stockholm area where they brought together a collaboration of technology vendors, universities, the city themselves um, and really what this is aiming to do is to enable communication and knowledge sharing between these groups so that they can understand the challenges and problems of each individual department and see where potential alignment and efficiencies can be, can be found. Another example in the city of Paris, they had um, identified that they needed uh, a smart lighting system and they also had uh, to synchronize their traffic signal controls. So they combined these together into a single tender, knowing that by supporting these two challenges that were immediately in front of them, the solution they picked would inherently be more flexible than if they tendered them separately. And now the, the city are exploring how they can leverage that infrastructure to address other challenges in the future. Cities also have to have in mind that the, the solutions they're buying today are going to evolve. Uh, one of the challenges is when you run a tender for two years, it, the rate of innovation at the moment means the technology that is available at the end will look quite different than what was available at the beginning. So planning for the fact that solutions will evolve through the life of the contract is very important. Um, and we've seen some examples, for example, the, the long PPI projects in the UK that really didn't build any framework to promote or incentivize innovation across an 18-year time period had led to assets kind of languishing and, and slow innovation. And linked to that, cities need to find a way to think about how their contracts and tenders will actually enable the kind of collaboration that we want to achieve. If tenders are closing down and locking vendors into one position, they won't be able to collaborate with each other simply because of the contractual um, structures that they're, they're within. So that is a challenge that cities will have to participate in, because um, certainly they can't put all the risk onto the technology vendors, or they'll find that they shut, shut down collaboration as well. And there's certain elements of the technology that the city needs to take a leadership role in. So part of this is enabling the ability for the solution to evolve in conjunction with the city. But certain elements such as security need to be planned for up front and have a consistent policy across the city if we want the ability to combine different applications in the future. Otherwise, the, the, the weakest part of the system will become the vulnerability. And there's, there, there's clearly many examples um, of IoT security issues um, in, in different markets. And a lot of cities and technology vendors are, are opting for a security through obscurity type approach where they say, well, why would anyone want to hack a streetlight, for example? But the reality is someone will always find a reason, even if it's just for their own entertainment. And um, so cities have to think about this up front. So my final slide. Uh, before I return you to your, the rest of your evening is to look at some examples of projects that we've worked over the last 18 months um, to, to work with cities on. Hard to do one at a time. Okay, so the city of New York had a challenge with gas leaks from their um, metering infrastructure. Uh, this would cause a lot of customer complaints and every so often it would lead to a catastrophic explosion. Um, so a very high priority for the utility to address. The issue they had is they couldn't find a sensor that met the quite challenging needs of the, the, the application. So ITRON worked with them to support a global tender and we managed to find a sensor from the industrial market. 
our developer program worked with them to integrate a battery operated mesh radio that would be able to connect to the city's network. They deployed 1,000 as part of a pilot and based on the success of that, they now deployed 375,000 of these sensors around New York, which are reporting daily. And they, uh, they're now finding 40 to 60 gas leaks per month, which they can proactively go and address ahead of, uh, rather than waiting for a customer to phone in and complain. Across the channel in the city of London, we asked them what challenges they had we started with them working with a street lighting project and they said that river safety was one of the areas they were wanting to improve and they specifically pointed at their um, their life buoys which are used in case someone falls in the water to be thrown in but the problem they had is that these were often vandalized or stolen by someone when they left the pub and so the city would send someone around every two weeks to check if they were all present and it meant that sometimes they weren't there when they were actually needed so Working with a, a company from Slovenia, we developed a, a sensor that simply monitors the presence of this, uh, this asset. If it's removed, um, the city are notified so they can go and, and rep replace it. Um, and the option to inform the Coast Guard as well so they can actually proactively respond to the incident. In Paris, one of the challenges that they've highlighted is irrigation of their parks. This was particularly acute during the COVID um, lockdowns when they weren't able to have as many staff um, working in the streets. And so they were looking to explore how can we have an automated sprinkler control system which measures moisture levels and then controls the sprinklers accordingly. <laughs> Hard to do this one at a time. At the other end of the extreme, in Cumbria in the UK, they have a challenge. They've had uh, three 100-year storms in the last 10 years. And so now they're looking to how can they proactively take measures to be prepared for these and respond more rapidly. So they're looking at two different systems. One that's monitoring river levels so they can get better information early if it looks like there's going to be flooding occurs and then also monitoring of their wastewater system to check if all their drains are running effectively. And finally in San Antonio we deployed a, a more classic smart city pilot where they combined a range of applications including smart parking with video based um, cameras that were monitoring the occupancy of parking bays um, and then giving inf information to drivers to navigate to spaces and also to enforcement officers and that was combined with noise sensors and air quality sensors bringing all that data together so the city could have a, a view of what was happening in their city at that time. So thank you very much I hope there was something interesting there for you and uh, as I mentioned I think we're ITRON are uh, looking for the next wave of technical partners that will help us address the next wave of challenges that our customers come to us. So please come and find us at one of our booths and uh, thank you very much. Music